My talk is titled Neurospirituality. And to start with, I want us to discuss some of the ways that we can think about spirituality. On the one hand, we can think about spiritual states. Uh, and a very iconic example of a spiritual state is when someone is, uh, as they say, slain in the spirit and they start speaking in tongues or they start having some really dramatic behavioral motif that is atypical relative to a state of consciousness that you would be observing if you were just walking down the street. In addition to spiritual states, we can think about spiritual traits. So a trait, unlike a state, is a long-term tendency that describes the individual's behavioral platform rather than the individual's behavioral moment. As we're looking at the neuroscientific underpinnings of traits and states, um, I became very interested in a phenomenon that is referred to across multiple cultures as feeling the spirit. Uh, and then with regard to spiritual traits, I'm very interested in mystical tendencies. So in other words, um, the likelihood of an individual to have a phenomenal and subsequently an attributional uh, narrative of something that defies a more, um, a more normative or a more routine set of experiences and explanations for those experiences. To examine spiritual states, this is a really well-fit set of questions for functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. And for measuring traits, these questions are very well fitted for the methods of lesion network mapping that you've heard mentioned a few times in this symposium already. Starting out then with spiritual states. Uh, as I mentioned, these are sets of questions that can be studied very well with the tools of fMRI, of functional magnetic resonance imaging. And these are types of experiments that have been popularized, they've captured the general imagination Essentially, you put someone inside of a, a very um, expensive and cumbersome machine, you have them performing tasks that are not necessarily ecologically valid, they're trying to approximate behaviors that an individual would perform in their routine daily life as best you can while inside of a machine that's making a lot of noise all around you. And the fMRI is measuring changes in blood flow. Blood flow is being redistributed based on local activations of neural tissue. When I was at the University of Utah working on my PhD, I had access to a specialty population of uh, return missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more colloquially, more colloquially known as the Mormon Church. And these are individuals who have a high level of religious commitment and devotion. Um, all of the participants who we recruited for our particular study had given uh, between 18 months to two years of full-time volunteer service where they were knocking on doors, they were discussing um, their core beliefs from the LDS faith. And we had these individuals who had given this volunteer time. So in other words, we're sampling individuals who are pre-screened for a high degree of religious commitment and devotion. We had them go into the scanner. You can see the soles of someone's feet as they're in this fMRI uh, machine here. And while they're in the fMRI device or machine rather, they're reading passages from the Book of Mormon, which is a sacred text within the Mormon faith. These individuals also had a button box with them inside of the scanner. So as they're reading passages from the Book of Mormon, they can push the button and tell us in real time when they're having uh, a feeling, an emotion, a moment that they would identify as feeling the spirit. Then what we did was we looked at all of those moments across all of these participants' brains in which they self-identified a phenomenal event of feeling the spirit. And we asked, what do all of these moments in time across all of these brains share in common with one another? And there were a series of regions that were associated with this experience of self-reported feeling the spirit. 
These regions that were consistently activated included frontal attention regions, the medial prefrontal cortex, and what really captured my attention most was the nucleus accumbens. And as was mentioned in the preceding talk on the neuroscience of beauty, the nucleus accumbens is intimately involved in the reward pathways of the human brain. It is a center for the dopaminergic system of the brain, and that becomes very crucial as we'll see moving forward here in this talk. Now, Karl Marx famously claimed that religion, religion is the opium of the people. However, if Karl Marx were a neuroscientist and he had access to the stimulation effects of religion on the dopaminergic system, he might have posited that religion is actually the cocaine of the people. It's excitatory, it doesn't sedate you. Um, that is at least if you were studying the sample of Latter-day Saints that we studied in the state of Utah. If you're interested for more about this particular study, I'll invite you to go to YouTube. You can type in, this is your brain on God. And I've got a TEDx talk um, that thankfully more people have liked than not. <laughs> and I will also be happy to talk more offline about this study because it's one that's very interesting to me for a number of reasons. Toggling then from spiritual states to spiritual traits. As I mentioned, I'm very interested to understand what are the differences in the brain that cause some people to report these mystical events and to create these attributional narratives that are mystical in nature more than other people. And in order to address these types of questions, I use a technique that's called lesion network mapping. Briefly, I'll describe lesion network mapping. It was pioneered by a medical scientist at our medical school named Michael Fox. And his review in the New England Journal of Medicine is the source for the next set of figures here. Um, in figure A, you see, as Isaiah also pointed out, uh, a lesion in a patient that became a very famous case study for identifying a language center in the brain that has come to be, no, come to be known as the Broca's area of the brain. In panel B, you see a brain lesion that helped us identify some of the important centers for episodic memory. This was from Henry Molaison. And essentially with lesion mapping in contrast to lesion network mapping, you're gathering sets of patients who have brain lesions that share a common symptom. And you're looking at what areas of the brain are commonly damaged across those patients who are showcasing the same symptom in order to ascertain a brain region that might be involved in that particular symptom. And this works really, really well if all of the lesions happen to line up in the same spot. However, more often than not, these lesions across these patients do not in fact overlap in the same location of the brain. This is a puzzle. One of the tools that we use to solve this puzzle is called the human connectome. The human connectome is a wiring diagram of the human brain. Think about your phone. Uh, your phone has a wiring diagram. It shows where all of the different areas of the circuit are connected. You're able to then infer systems that are involved in supporting core functions. And so similarly, if we look at the wiring diagram in the human brain, and we look at which regions are interconnected, both anatomically by specific fiber tracts or functionally, which is an indication of polysynaptic connections, then we can infer sets of regions that cooperate together in systems. Beautifully then, if you take lesions across patients that are causing a common symptom and you align these with the wiring diagram of the brain, what we're finding in our laboratory research is that with a very high percentage of accuracy, these lesions that cause a common symptom are part of a common brain circuit. Even if they're in different locations of the brain, once you look at the locations of these lesions through the lens of the human connectome, you have an aha moment where you can discern common underlying brain circuitry that unifies these lesions into a common system. Here's an example of some of the symptoms that we've looked at in our center. Uh, hemichoria is a motor disorder. Freezing of gait is also a motor disorder, but then also uh, psychiatric and higher cognitive behaviors such as delusions of familiarity and even criminality 
can be explained if you look at brain lesions that are causally influencing these symptoms and then view them through the lenses of the underlying connectome. So what if we treat mysticism as a symptom, so to speak, and I put that in scare quotes for a lot of different reasons. What if we treat mysticism as a symptom of spirituality? In order to test mysticism from a behavioral psychometric point of view, we're drawing on a scale that was introduced originally in 1975 and has been cited almost 800 times in the literature, which is a, that's a respectable number of citations within science. And this is a scale that gathers information about an individual's personal history of mystical experiences. Here's some examples of questions from the skill. So you have domains of ego quality, domains of unifying quality. And I want to be very quick to point out that to, to, to your average scientist, all of these terms would sound like gobbledygook, but we as, we as members of this neurospirituality panel, we're not average scientists or average enthusiasts. We are exceptional and let's lean into that. So with our uh, exceptional interests here, some of the questions are things like, I have had an experience in which something greater than myself seemed to absorb me. I have had an experience in which everything seemed to disappear from my mind until I was only aware of a void. Um, and then with unifying qualities, I've had an experience in which I realized the oneness of myself with all beings, et cetera. So you, you have the patients answer these questions, you quantify their answers to these questions, and then you can come up with a single score that represents their trait of mysticism. Now, what I did is I looked at 106 patients who all have brain lesions in different parts of the brain. In this top row, these are examples of brain lesions in five patients who scored very highly on this scale of mysticism. And in the bottom row, you have brain lesions from five patients who scored low on this scale of mysticism. And as you can see from from basic and simple visual inspection, these areas of, of brain damage are distributed in different parts of the brain. So then again, we're gonna ask this question, well, what if we then take these lesions? What if we use the wiring diagram of the brain to convert these lesions into lesion networks? And then rather than only looking at the spot that's been damaged, what if we look at the circuit that's been damaged? Is there anything that they share in common across all of these patients? So using uh, a little bit of fancy math, some permutation analysis of linear models, we relate the underlying patterns in the brain with the behavioral scores for traits of mysticism. And it turns out that indeed, there is a biologically coherent network that comes into focus when I use this approach of lesion network mapping. Now, again, I, like I mentioned, we had orchestrated the talk on the neuroscience of beauty and neurospirituality based on some of their historical conceptual alignments. And wonderfully and delightfully, it turns out that there is an underlying neurobiological convergence as well between the neuroscience of beauty and neurospirituality. And in particular, as I'm looking at some of the circuits that underlie these variations and traits of mysticism, what you see is some circuits that are connecting the ventral tegmentum of the brain, which is an area where you have cell bodies for these dopaminergic cells. And then connections going into the nucleus accumbens, which again is a key area in the dopamine system of the brain. And so this is, this is very exciting for a number of reasons, uh, not only because it's dopaminergic, oh, bad neuroscience pun here, uh, but because this is, a, this is a biologically coherent pattern that is coming out from our results as we're looking at something as seemingly esoteric as mysticism. Comparing this trait mapping result to our state mapping result, again, we can see that there are common circuits that are being identified, whether we're looking at these state mapping techniques through fMRI or these trait mapping techniques of lesion network mapping. And that's, that's really encouraging when across different modalities, across different data sets, you see a biological convergence in your results. So where could this knowledge be leading us? Well, one of the places where I would like to steer this knowledge is toward what I'm referring to as a global neurospirituality initiative. And the big picture for this idea of a global neurospirituality initiative is to first create a systematic categorization 
of spiritual practices. Secondly, to have neurospirituality investigations based on this ontology and taxonomy of spiritual practices. And then thirdly, to have evidence-based clinical translations where we're actually applying some of these spiritual practices in a therapeutic modality. Looking briefly here at the potential for phase one of a systematic categorization of spiritual practices, if we borrow from the playbook of the systematic categorization of life, which is going to be known as a biology, we can look at this hierarchy where you have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, family, genus, and species. So at the very high level, where you have a domain with really broad differences and features. For example, is this an active spiritual practice or is this a contemplative spiritual practice? So by an active spiritual practice, it might be something like feeding the poor. A contemplative spiritual practice, it might be something like meditating in isolation. And then it follows downstream that you'll have differences in categorization for kingdom levels, phylum levels, class levels, family levels, genus levels, all the way down to species levels. So if specific spiritual practices, and this is an if, if specific spiritual practices do indeed stimulate specific brain circuits, then in principle, we can integrate specific spiritual practices into the treatment of specific symptoms which localize to the same circuit. An example here at a behavioral level is compassion practices. There is an increasing amount of evidence that compassion-based interventions at a statistically significant rate decrease symptoms of depression, they decrease symptoms of shame, and they also decrease feelings of social marginalization. So now if you're looking at an interventional point of view, these clusters of symptoms start to sound very common to a particular demographic that is dear to me. And this is a demographic of conversion therapy survivors. So in other words, individuals who are gender or sexual minorities, who have gone through some kind of a clinical or pseudo clinical process to try and reorient their sexual identity or their gender identity to one that is more heterosis normative. These individuals have significantly elevated levels of depression, shame, and feelings of social marginalization. And so at least at the behavioral level of analysis, it stands to reason that some sort of a compassion-based intervention could integrate meaningfully into a therapeutic intervention for an individual who's gone through conversion therapy. Once again, the big picture is to have a systematic categorization of spiritual practices, to have a neurospiritual investigation of these practices, and then based on the level of underlying neurobiological convergence to begin testing whether specific spiritual practices could have therapeutically valuable impacts on specific symptoms, once again, based on a shared underlying brain circuitry. If this type of interaction and thought is interesting to you, I would encourage you to stay abreast of the work that I'm doing with the Global Neurospirituality Initiative. It will be coming soon at the domain neurospirituality.com. It's not live quite yet, but in a few days it will be launching. And I would like to thank you and uh, as a little bit of a rallying cry, say let's illuminate our worlds. <laughs>